Good afternoon. My name is Philippe Henrigou. I want to tell you about my Mongol clusters. Because most of the time, I have a wonderful relationship with my Mongol clusters. But sometimes, they just stop responding to me. They don't take my requests anymore. So in these cases, I'm a little lost. I'm like, how should I feel about it? What can I do about it? And that's pretty much what I want to cover uh, tonight. You know, what you can do when your Mongol cluster is misbehaving and you cannot figure out what's going on. Um, so in case you're still wondering about the accent. <laughs> Oop. Yes, I'm French. I'm working for a company called Thoughtworks, which is providing consulting services, um, specializing in agile, and also um, cool and exciting technologies like Ruby. I wrote, uh, published with Addison Wesley, a shortcut on the topic of uh, Ruby troubleshooting, uh, covering how you can uh, leverage system tools like LSOF, uh, S-Trace, and GDB in the context of uh, Ruby. And you might also know me uh, for my involvement as a creator and uh, main author of uh, Selenium Grid. Uh, by the way, we need to talk about virtual Selenium tests because uh, there's a way not to do that. Uh, so Selenium Grid uh, is a tool that lets you run uh, your Selenium tests in a distributed manner across multiple machines. So you can run your tests in parallel. And instead of waiting three hours for your test to finish, you wait 10 minutes. Anyhow, uh, the important stuff is why I'm here tonight. The main reason dates back once upon a time, like a year and a half ago, Patrick Fowley, who did the presentation Ruby internals, myself and a couple of other thought workers, we were on a pretty ambitious Ruby on Rails. Okay. We're working on a pretty ambitious Ruby on Rails project, is that all? Okay. Thanks. Uh, which we're talking to a lot of database, uh, multiple database from the same Ruby on Rails application, multiple web services, a pretty aggressive user load. So it was kind of big, enterprisey, ambitious Ruby on Rails project. And we're having fun on it. Our velocity was pretty high until we started to assess the stability of our app. And we realized that our Rails instances were getting stuck and call it frozen pretty quickly, pretty consistently, but unfortunately at random times, at random requests, and just looking at the logs, just trying to instrument Ruby, we couldn't go anywhere, and we were not even close to find the problem, and the root of the problem. So this is when Pat Fowley, who was a tech lead at the time, uh, came to me and a colleague of mine called Jason Miller and said, hey, Philippe and Jason, you know the stability problem we have? I was like, yeah, yeah. You need to solve it quickly. So we responded, of course, but, but you know, ahead, both of us were thinking, we don't even know where to start. So when you have a tough problem on your hands and you don't even know where to start, usually it's good to ask a little help from your friends. We're a big software community, right? There's a lot of people that could help us. So we went around and we asked the PHP dude. <laughs> We even ask the .NET troopers, you know? <laughs> and we were so desperate, we even ask Java the Hut, you know? Super powerful, hardly lightweight. But it turns out, none of these guys could really help us. You know, they said, you have to think about yourself. You have to think about who you are as a Ruby community, as Ruby developers. So let's think about who we are, you know? We are nimble, for sure. We're moving fast. We have style. We have values and principle. And more importantly, we have the force. So who can we be but Jedis? So the cool thing about being a Jedi, Ruby developer, is life is easy, right? We have our problems. We just use the force. A little Ruby, Ruby trick, you know? RLB, script console, looking at the logs. Raise inspect, we're out of trouble in no time. And that works for us 99% of the time. But sometimes we're in real world trouble. Usually in a production environment, you know? And not only we're in trouble, but this is one of these cases when we have to solve the problem quickly 
and the entire team is counting on us. Does that sound familiar? It's a little like, you know, Luke in his mission to destroy the Death Star, you know? So when you're in this kind of situation, it's good to remember that even a Jedi is never alone. When you're concentrating on, you know, fighting and steering your ship, for the whole time, there was somebody in the back, you know, who was working hard, keeping Jensen's running, keeping the energy level high for you. You remember him? <laughs> so this guy, we have it as we be developers. We have our own little R2D2 just for us. We have somebody that keeps our Ruby applications running all the time. We don't even know about it. We forget about it. It's called the operating system. Unix, for most of us, the lucky ones, you know? <laughs> so, and it turns out there's a lot, in my experience, Ruby developers, for some reason, might not know all of them. Uh, and they're well documented, you know, in the world. Uh, there's a lot of tools you could use with a lot of success, you know, LSOF, IOSTAT, TARP, PSTAT, whatever, you, could, you name it. Uh, something you might not know about is the some of the tools that are not only system level, they also give you at the same time information about your Ruby, stuff happening in Ruby, and stuff happening at the system, which is pretty cool, because then you can correlate information easily and see what's going on. So tonight, I'm going to concentrate mostly on two of these tools where you can see what's happening in Ruby or what's happening in your system at the same time. The first one, unexpectedly, is GDB, the GNU debugger. So acting as a C debugger, GDB can tell you everything what's happening in C. So everything that's happening in your system level, like system calls, signals, everything that's happening in your Ruby interpreter. But what you might not know is, with a couple of clever macros, you could also, from GDB, do stuff like getting a stack trace, a Ruby stack trace, raising a Ruby exception, or even evaluate arbitrary Ruby code, which is pretty freaking cool. So you guys want to see that tonight? So let's try to get started. Um, it's mostly going to happen in a terminal. <laughs> so I've got a little Raze application, which I'm going to launch. I'm going to try to find it. Uh, so three actions in one control. The first one I'm going to call just right now. So it's basically mostly sleeping and returning. So the important stuff here is you see my action is working. My Mongol cluster is happy, up and running. Then something is going to happen. Actually, let me start over again because I forgot one critical step, I think. Maybe not. Grip. Yep. Let me start over. Up. Here we go. So now something is going to happen that you don't know anything. Oop. Uh, something strange is going to happen, you don't know anything about. But all of a sudden, when you're going to start to target your Mongol cluster, Rails is not going to respond anymore. By the way, it's never Mongol the problem. You know, every time I investigate a lot of this, you know, troubleshooting problems in production, it's never Mongol. It's always your code, Rails, your database, your system, you name it. Mongol is pretty freaking solid on that. Uh, so when you're like this, well, let's try to use GDB to attach to the process. So first I need to know what the process is, the PID. Now that I got my PID, I'm going to try to attach to it. Here we go. So now it's a C debugger, right? So I can know what's going on at C level. So let's try to get a backtrace, a C backtrace. I got my backtrace. So here, it's not going to tell me much, right? Of course, I'm evaluating Ruby code. I knew that. Uh, what's more interesting is if you've got a 
top of a stack. Where am I stuck? If we go up, whoop, actually, let's try again. It's going to be easier. If we go to a high level of stack, I see, oh, that's what I'm blocked on. I'm trying to get the lock on the file. Uh, so why am I trying to get the lock on the file? Well, it seems to be this kind of black magic.c is doing something, start trains. Oh, I kind of remember. I'm kind of, I think I'm using a native gem called black magic. That might be it. But from where? Which controller is curving this? So what would be cool would be to be able to get the stack trace, right? What Ruby stack trace, not just a C level stack trace. So let me try to go to my process. Here we go. I'm going to clear the process so that you can see the output. I'm going to show up some space here. Not this guy. And then there's a pretty freaking cool macro done by Mauricio Fernandez of Egan Class fame, which allows you to eval whatever Ruby code you want. So let's try this. Oh, that works. Let's try something else. Maybe, maybe that would be a good way to get a stack trace, eval caller. Sure enough, we got our stack trace. And if I go up, whoop, let me clear this and do it again. If I go up in my buffer, I can tell you, oh, I'm in my controller, showcase, line six, in the action provide business value. And if I were going to my code, I would figure out pretty quickly, oh, this is when I use this black magic James style trains. <coughs> So you could argue that what would be nice would be to know which file I'm trying to lock on. Uh, that would be a great job for LSOF, but we'll leave this to another talk. Uh, you're welcome to check LSOF documentation if you want. So if I can evaluate arbitrary Ruby code, I can evaluate caller. That's pretty cool. But I couldn't even go crazy, right? I could do stuff like, actually, let me clear my window first. I could go like object space each string, or each object, sorry. And I could say, well, for all of the, each of these strings, just print them. And I've got all the strings in my web instance. Not super useful, but on the same principle, you could try to evaluate, find all the classes in your system and walk the object space and try to see how many of them you have. It turns out actually a pretty nice micro to do that. Uh, let me clear this up and do it again. So now we see that we have only one mongrel, one what we're showing. But we could see how many strings, how many hash, how many modules we have. Could be handy. So that's going to be it for the demo. Something important when you attach to a process with GDB, actually I could show that to you maybe, is if I try to control C here, I'm not going to be able to exit. That's called GDB is getting a lock on your process, so you first need to exit from GDB. Cool. So something also um, I didn't tell you, I cheated a little bit, is for GDB to do its magic, you need to be able to access the debugging information of your process, which most of the time it's a non-issue. Uh, if you're on Linux or Solaris, stuff like that, you're pretty much okay with out-of-the-box Ruby interpreter. On uh, macOS Leopard, uh, the interpreter is not compiled with debug information. So if you want to do this kind of tricks, you're better off with compiling your own Ruby, which by default enables debugs, and uh, use it to troubleshoot your problem. So. Let's review a little bit. Uh, first, let's give credit to who it's due. All these wonderful macros, I didn't make them. I wish I could, I did. Uh, they've been done by James Buck, uh, two of them. And most of them, they call them Mauricio Fernandez and uh, Nobu. Uh, and that's, if you look at them, I'll tell you later how to get them and download them. It's pretty freaking awesome. They're basically re-implementing re eval, but as GDB macros. That's pretty cool. So 
let me review some macros with you. First, how can we get the macros? Uh, you can get them in different places on the internet. The easiest way is actually to go to my website, ph7spot.com. Uh, on uh, this page, you're going to find download link. You get all the macros compiled together with additional documentation. Uh, save it as a .gdb init in your home directory, and you're golden. So what kind of macros can you have? Well, this one is one of the most important ones. Uh, it's all be finished. You're basically not doing anything except putting you in a safe state. Because you might attach to your process in a state where it's not safe for an interpreter to without arbitrary code. So all be finished is taking care of that. Put you in a safe state so you can keep going. The next macro uh, is the best one, eval, uh, which can evaluate, uh, evaluate arbitrary Ruby code, especially caller when you're in trouble and want to get a stack trace. Some other ones, this one is by James Buck. This is a way to get the Ruby backtrace, the Ruby backtrace, not the C1, from GDB, interpreting the C-level backtrace. Uh, it's not working all the time, though. So like, when it's not working, use eval caller. I'll be raised is a nice little trick by James Buck, too. It's a way to raise from C a Ruby exception so you can get your stack trace in your, in your log most of the time. So all these macros are going to put the output to the standard output of your process. Sometimes it's a little difficult to trace down the output. Most of the time, mongol.log. But if you don't know, you could temporarily redirect the output and then restore it. Then your output ends up in a temporary file in uh, the slash tmp ruby-debug-pid directory. So GDB is a pretty nice tool. It's better than nothing uh, to figure out what's going on at C level and at Ruby level. Uh, and gives you pretty good visibility in what's going on from what I call the Jedi space, you know, Ruby interpreter, and application space, which is your, more like Yoda, you know? Uh, but you can get too much into R2D2. You can get too much into this operating system because there's a fundamental limitation in Unix about between kernel space and user space. Another important stuff to understand about GDB also is that when you attach your process with GDB, you basically capture a snapshot of your process, just like any debugger, right? So when you see your application with GDB, it's basically like this. It's frozen, you know? Uh, so if your problem is dynamic, or if you want to monitor the dynamic behavior of your application, GDB is not going to be able to help you. So GDB is a great tool, you know? Uh, it feels like a Jedi pistol. You'd be very glad you have it. But also it gets jammed. You know, I would lie to you if I would promise you that any pro Ruby process you have that's locked, you're going to attach it to GDB, and all these macros are going to work out of the box, and you're going to get answers to all your questions. That's not true. That's true 70 80% of the time. There's still this last mile when the macros are not working, and it's going to be very hard for you to figure that out. So it feels like we're a very nice tool. We have a pistol as a Jedi. But we wish we had a more powerful, more comprehensive tool, you know? Something more like a lightsaber. And actually, Ruby developers do have a lightsaber already. It's called D-Trace. Sun made it just for us, you know? Or more exactly, just for the ones that are running on uh, OS X, BSD, or Solaris. Uh, so D-Trace is a revolutionary, amazing, dynamic tracing tool uh, made by Sun, but that you can now find on Leopard and on BSD. Uh, what's so amazing about it? Well, the best part about it is, you remember, there was this fundamental divide between user space and kernel space? With D-Trace, you can see everything in your system. Everything, everything. It means the deepest kernel internals, if you can make sense out of them, uh, and the higher level constructs of your Rails application. Uh, so why is it so good? Well, first, you only learn one tool. You know, one tool to rule them all. Uh, but also, more importantly, if you use only one, as opposed to you know, using logs in your Rails application, instrumenting the Ruby VM, and becoming a guru in tracing you know, what's happening in your kernel, uh, the stuff about D-Trace is, instead of having this information in different places with different format, that's, it's going to be very hard to correlate you know, to put one in relation with the other. Because using one tool, you can correlate all this information. So you could answer quite very easily questions very difficult to achieve, like within this Rails request, so high in application level, 
just for this particular worst request. Tell me all the system calls <laughs> that are called only during this method, because you have visibility of the whole stack. So this is extremely powerful. Uh, sometimes D-Trace is used like, as a sysadmin tool. Uh, we need to take it over, and we need to make it a Ruby tool, you know, and other things. Uh, so remember, like, GDB was a lot like frozen processes, static view of your process. D-Trace is the total opposite. It's all about dynamic aspect of your application. It's all about motion. And a matter of fact, it's a lot like motion capture. In a sense of D-Trace is going to be able to monitor little probes that you're going to put on your application, just like these little bulbs on a motion capture outfit, and monitor in real time all the actors uh, working on your system. So it's a little like motion capture, but even better, even more complex. Because not only you monitor in real time, but you monitor multiple levels in real time. You know, you go from the bare bone system view to the mechanics of it, more like the Ruby interpreter, to the full flesh body of your Rails application. So you can see everything at the same time in real time. But basically, there's no limit to your visibility, there's just limit to your understanding of what you're capturing and how to make sense out of it. So first, a quick show of hand. How many people here already use D-Trace? Okay, yeah, quite a bit. And how many people know about the D scripting language? <coughs> okay, pretty much the same. <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna cover a little bit of introductory material on D-Trace to make sure you understand what's going next. So first, a little bit of vocabulary. Uh, D-Trace is tracing what is called D-Trace probes. A probe is pretty much like a sensor you put in your code uh, at location, it's a location, it's an event you care about and that makes sense to you and you want to be able to record and capture. So in a lot of ways you can see these D-Trace probes as a little bulbs on a motion capture often, as stuff you can capture and monitor. These D-Trace probes, one of the amazing stuff about them is you can enable them or disable them on demand. So to keep the analogy about little bulbs, imagine some of the bulbs, you can turn them on and off on demand to capture only what you want. I mean, just the arm, maybe the full body. Uh, and to keep the analogy even further, if you're going to turn off a bulb in a motion capture outfit, it's not going to use any electricity, right? You're saving on electricity. The same stuff with D-Trace. If you disable a probe by design, the D-Trace impact, the performance impact of D-Trace on disabled probes is very close to zero. So the great stuff by being, clo being close to zero is you can use it in production. Like you can launch your application with D-Trace probes turn off. And when we have a problem, you just turn on a couple of probes here and there to analyze what's going on and progressively understand what's going on in your system. So you can analyze the problem you care about in the environment you care about, your production, and at the layer you care about. You can be very selective. Uh, so probes are little sensors, little bulbs on the system. Uh, when a probe is enabled, uh, D-Trace can listen to them, and when they trigger, when they are encountered, they trigger something that fire, what we call an event. This event you can record, capture, and you can do all kind of uh, analysis on it. We're gonna see that later with examples. Uh, so the question would be like, oh, you're talking about these probes, these probes, these probes. Where do they come from? Well, somebody has to give it to them, to provide them to us. Uh, and it's called providers. And basically it's some user space libraries or some kernel modules that somebody writes for you at providing instrumentation for something you care about. So let's say your TCP IP stack, let's say your system calls, let's say your Ruby interpreter, let's say Postgres, let's say JavaScript interpreter, uh, could be whatever you want. So now that we know this, we can try to understand the D language. The D language is all about, uh, when this probe is triggered, what should I do? So it's very, very simple. Uh, D is pretty much influenced by C in its syntax, uh, so you shouldn't be lost at all. So the first line is gonna be always, this is pseudo D. Uh, the first line is going to be a probe description. Why should I, which probe, which little bulb should I listen to? Uh, and when you listen to this probe, 
the action that's going to be between curly braces is going to get executed. What so you're doing in the action, you're going to print information, you're going to collect information, you're going to aggregate information, you're going to do something. And you have this second line, the slash predicate stuff. That's an additional um, refinement you could have on your probes. You could say, oh, my, my probe fires, but only under these conditions. Only when all the conditions in my predicates are true, then you're going to do my action. Make sense? So let's see what kind of predicates could we have. It's very, very simple. Like, it's going to look familiar to you. You could be like, I'm only running on one CPU. I only care about stuff happening on one CPU. Or I only care about one process. Or I don't care when a program is actually the system scheduler. And of course, you can combine all these uh, conditions together using the regular C uh, conditions. So that's more like a real life sample. That's true D code. So this one is like, remember the first line is a probe description? Here's a probe description is, for every system call that's of right when it stops, okay? So at this moment, what am I gonna do? Uh, only, then I'm going to the second line for the predicates. Only the condition is gonna be true. So only if the program is actually bash. And in these cases, I'm gonna just print a little message uh, telling you the PID of the bash process that uh, is doing the write. So not rocket science, but actually very powerful. We're going to see that in a second. Uh, so what kind of action can you do uh, within your curly braces block? Uh, you could do a lot of stuff, but most of the time, it ends up being printing information with printf, regular C syntax, print A, which is more printing aggregation. You could kind of print you know, sum, average, uh, distribution of values. Uh, you could also capture the stack, the kernel stack, or the user's level stack of your process. Useful to know, like, you could, uh, every 10 seconds, see where you are in your system and figure out where you're spending time in your system. <coughs> and you could also create variables and uh, capture a timestamp and put it in a variable. Here, that's the last line, is assigning a variable to a suede safe storage self so that you can use it later. Uh, so sometimes people think D-Trace is only to listen to events. Uh, that's somewhat true, but that's very powerful. For example, you can use D-Trace for performance analysis to capture how long it's taking you to do something. And the pattern is always the same. It looks like this. First, you're going to start something. Every time we're starting a read system call uh, for Apache, the daemon HTTPD, what are we going to do? We're going to capture in a thread local uh, storage, a variable we're going to call start. That's going to be the timestamp for when this stuff started. So now we have, we have the start of the process. So next we're going to define a rule which is saying, oh, no what I'm returning from my read system call. Uh, you remember this timestamp I had in the start? I'm going to minus it from the timestamp of now, which is how long it took, and I'm going to print it. I could you know, aggregate it or distribute it too. Uh, there's a little trick, there's some little trick around there, like if you look at the second line, uh, this is in there to make sure actually we actually did record the entry before returning, recording the return, because with D-Trace you attach to whatever process, so we might very well record a return before uh, recording a read. Um, so what can you do with D-Trace? What kind of providers do you have? What kind of stuff can you listen to? Well, if you have a MacBook Pro of running Solaris, uh, just do a sudo dtrace-l, uh, you're going to see all the providers you have. It's pretty amazing by default. Uh, just to give you a little taste, uh, here are some providers that cover pretty much the whole stack. You know, from uh, kernel level providers, so you know, system call, you know, PID, VM stat. Uh, also network stuff, there's some pretty amazing uh, providers for you know, UDP traffic, TCP traffic, NFS traffic. Um, and also like very high level language interpreters. There's some pretty amazing provider for JavaScript. Uh, no, we, thanks to Giant, we have providers for Ruby, uh, but also there are some providers for Java and Erlang. Uh, and even for stuff that are like bigger pieces of software like you know, database, Postgres, or even X11 and uh, Adobe Hair. There was a pretty cool demo in d 2 conf um, about Adobe Hair. So, of course, we mostly care about some of them, which is the Ruby probes. Now we can trace Ruby you know, with D-Trace, which is pretty awesome. 
So big kudos to Giant, who wrote these probes in the first place, mostly for their you know, Solaris platform. Uh, then uh, Apple uh, was the amazing job at incorporating these probes in Leopard, and you have them for free in Leopard. So on Solaris and Leopard, you pretty much, you know, out of the box, you get these uh, Ruby probes, uh, which is pretty nice. So what kind of stuff can you probe with these Ruby probes? Uh, it's pretty inclusive. Uh, you can trace every time you entering a function, entering every time you're returning from a function, every time you're raising an exception, every time you rescue it. You can even trace every line of code you execute for each single file, which is pretty you know, amazing. Uh, every time the garbage collection is starting or stopping, every time you're starting to create an object and finish starting creating an object, which if you have huge allocation time for creating Ruby objects might be useful. Every time you free an object. And the last probe, Ruby dash probe, is actually one of the coolest, but I'm gonna tell you about it for right now. Uh, I'll keep it for later. So now is about time to see this in action. <coughs> so let me go back to my little Rails application. Which I'm gonna restart. I'm going to reduce the duration of the call so it less. So basically, I'm running Rails application, nothing very fancy here. What's more fancy is that now I can use Dtrace to kind of see what's going on at multiple levels. So let's first start at the system level. Uh, so Dtrace is a command line tool. You need root privilege to use it. Uh, and you can inline some scripting like this. Uh, so I'm gonna to try to record all the system calls happening and no I can see everything that's happening at the system level uh, on my system, which is pretty cool. But of course you wanna see what's going on at Ruby level. So let's try one of the probe for Ruby. So first I'm gonna to need to know which process I'm gonna target. So there's something a little strange on Leopard with Ruby probes is that they are not enabled until you launch a Ruby process. So if you do a d2s-l and don't see any Ruby probe and you're freaking out, just launch a Ruby process, they're gonna appear. So now we could try to target every function we execute. So Ruby. I don't see my terminal anymore. Function entry, and need to give the PID of the process. And of course, I need to be root. So now I see every time I execute a function. What's not very useful is, sure, I'm entering a function uh, or method. Uh, which one is that, you know? <laughs> I want to know better. Uh, so every probes give you some arguments which I'll call arg0 and arg1, which you can print. So let's do it. <coughs> so that would be the intuitive way of doing it. Unfortunately, that's not the way it works. Uh, because arg0 and arg1 are coming from user space. Dtrace is instrumented at kernel space. So you want to copy from your space to kernel space this argument so can Dtrace can make sense out of it. So there's a little utility to do this. Oops. Mm -hmm. 
And now I see which object. Oh, it's two, probably twice arc zero, not arc one. I see which object, but also which method I'm entering in real time, which I could correlate with system calls for this particular method, which is pretty freaking cool. So this is basically relying on system instrumentation. This is relying on Ruby instrumentation. But wouldn't it be cool if you could go even higher? Remember, I promised you you can go to your application level. And it feels like, how am I going to do that? How am I going to be able to go from uh, stuff that's provided to me as providers in C code, which I probably don't want to write, to something I can trigger from my Rails application, Ruby application, that's going to make sense for me. That'd be nice, right? Every time we're starting a new request, we could trigger a probe. And every time we start uh, stopping the request, we could trigger an event based on uh, another probe. So it hands out uh, giant, the giant guys did that. If you look at the source code they're providing for Solar, the Ruby VM on Solaris, they have something called, I mean, they're using the Ruby tracer. They have a method called fire. And if you give two arguments to fire, basically two strings, you remember this arg0 and arg1, that's what you're going to get. Uh, you can trigger the probe, uh, detrace uh, probes and uh, events you can trace, which is pretty freaking cool. You can even give it a block, and it's going to trigger an event at the start and then at the end, which is very, very cool. The problem is I don't run Solaris. I love Solaris. You know, I love open Solaris, but as servers, not too much on my laptop. So when I was preparing for the demo, I was like, hey, I want to do the demo on, uh, on Leopard. I don't want to do it on Solaris. Uh, so I looked for tracer, for dot .fire on, Solar, on uh, Leopard. Couldn't find it. So I was going crazy. I was like, I can't believe Apple was so smart to introduce all these probes and they leave away tracer. This is so powerful. Well, actually, after a little bit of investigation and going into the internals, I found out Apple did provide tracer. It's just called dtracer. And unfortunately, it's not exactly the same API. It doesn't take a block and provide a new method called is enabled that tells you if the Ruby probe is enabled. Uh, so it's kind of, OK, that's cool. But I want my applications to have the same code to run on any platform. I want it to run it on a joint VM in service in production. I want to run it on a Leopard VM for the dev you know, in the development environment. And for this QA and business analyst guys you know, running Linux or running Windows, well, I want this for them to work too, the same code, even though there's no D-trace you know, facility on the platform. So I wrote a little gem called X-Ray, which is basically just abstracting you from all this different implementation stuff and give you one interface to all the systems and uh, no implementation for when you don't have D-trace. So let's see this, how it would look like. So let's imagine we have a Ruby class, just my application, I want to trigger a D-trace probe every time I'm starting my application, so every time I'm entering this start method. Well, with X-Ray or D-tracer or tracer, uh, that's very easy. You do something like fire, arg0, arg1. And whatever arg0 and arg1, you decide what it is, what's meaningful to you. Uh, of course, this fire method needs to come from somewhere, so you need to include a little module uh, and require it, and you're all done. So extremely easy. Any Ruby developer can make it, can do it, and it gives you tremendous instrumentation uh, at all levels of your stack. Of course, most of the time, you don't want to record only when something starts. You, know? you want to record when something starts and when something ends. So a nice convenience way to do that is to use X-Ray to do like firing, and you got this arc 0 and arc one again. You give it a block. And automatically, in this case, my-ws-start will be triggered at the beginning before executing the block, and my-ws-end will be triggered after executing the block. So it's pretty convenient. So let's try to see it in action. Uh, I'm going to show you this showcase controller. So I'm going to try to do something useful, which is using this firing stuff here. So when I'm entering a request, I want to trigger a probe with custom request, do something useful, which is basically the name 
of my action. And then let's imagine somewhere here I'm doing some kind of database access. I like to fire a custom DB uh, stuff with the actual SQL query I'm executing to monitor how long I'm spending in that. So if I'm trying to run this action, here we go. So now let's try to use dtrace to see if our custom tracing uh, can be recorded. So I'm going to go, remember this magic ruby-probe I didn't want to tell you about? That's exactly what it is for. So we're going to use it. And no, nothing happens. Nothing happens because my request application is not moving, right? The requests are not getting in. So let's get a couple of requests. And all my probes are firing. So if you're paying a lot of attention, you might realize that some probes seems to be out of order. So you could have rendering finish. I mean, you could have your request finish before your rendering, which doesn't make any sense. Uh, this is actually a feature of Dtrace in a sense that uh, this is happening when you're changing scheduling on multiple CPUs. These strings are recorded by Dtrace on each CPU, and to avoid, and they want, Dtrace team wants it to be very lightweight, no impact on performance. So they don't bother correlating on each CPU the two different flows. So if, you, if it's a problem to you, just print a timestamp, and you can solve that timestamp. Of course, if you want to record time and timestamp and stuff like this, this is not impacted uh, by this CPU scheduling stuff. So I hope you're excited about it. Uh, but the thing is, do you really want to write this for all your Rails requests? I don't think so. So part of X-Ray 2 is easy and on-the-fly instrumentation of all your actions to know how long you're spending in uh, request time, in rendering time, and database time. Monkey patching, active record, and uh, action control. So of course I'm going to need to restart my Rails application at this point. Oop, we don't need GDB anymore. So let's restart it. Uh, now I'm going to execute another action on my controller, which is more a classic Rails action. You'll notice there's nothing Dtrace specific here. It's all going to happen uh, magically with monkey patching. Uh, so let's go back to the Dtrace window. And let's do the same thing, because it's pretty much the same thing. Remember, this ruby dash probe stuff is always triggered for your custom application level probes. And here, arg0 and arg1, I'm going to be, is it a request? Is it rendering? And the argument is going to be which request it is or which uh, SQL I'm executing for DB query. So process change. So here we go. Again, nothing is happening because I would need to use my application to make something happen. So let's go to this controller, clear everything so we can see better, and do our request. And sure enough, we see we started a request. We ending a request. The rendering started, the rendering handed, and the DB access started and DB access handed. So here we're out, we're not out of order, which is pretty lucky. Um, so that's pretty cool. But what I really might really want to know is how long I'm spending in rendering, how long I'm spending in database, right? That would be way more useful. Uh, so let me try to show that to you very quickly. So of course, this is more involved, so I'm not going to do it on the command line in one line, I think. Uh, I'm going to use, you can write dtrace scripts. So it's more something like this. So you could have a big in block, which is going to get executed when you start your script. No big deal here. Uh, I'm just saying control C to N, because basically here, I'm going to compute times, right? So it, basically, I'm going to aggregate information. Instead of just putting information on the fly, I'm going to capture information, aggregate it, process it, normalize it, and then give it back to you. So you have a big, you could have a big in block, and you could have an block too. Oop. 
It shows you cutting at the beginning and at the end. Uh, let's focus just on the first probes. So this one is saying, for each uh, probe that I'm triggering, that's the start of a new request, well, just capture the time as a local variable called request start. Uh, and this is actually not a regular local variable. This is an aggregation local variable. Think of it as a map, hash map. So for this particular action, so I'm going to be able to trace by action. It was the name of the action. Then when my request is ending, I'm making sure this is really a request end. I'm making sure that previously I did record uh, a start for this guy. Then I'm going to count how many times I invoke this request. I'm going to compute how much time I spend in this request. I'm going to compute the average, the sum, and even quantize, quantize the time spent in the, in the request. And if you look down, you're going to see exactly the same stuff for database success. So let's try to run the script. It's going to be way more meaningful. Sorry. So here we go. Control C to end. So first I need to generate a couple of requests. I'm going to try to generate a couple of classic requests. <coughs> We should go pretty fast, then, and also be consistent. Then I'm going to try this particular action, because I can trigger how long it's taking with this parameter. So I'm going to do two of them that are pretty consistent in time, and one that's very inconsistent. And hopefully you're going to be able to see that. So we're going to see, not only are we going to be able to see how much on average we're spending in one request, for each request, we're going to be able to see, oh, do I have a consistent time for this request, or is it all over the board? So let's try to get our results now. Uh, let me clear my buffer, which we'll see. So let's see what we have. So for the showcase controller, classic action, I see it's pretty consistent. The distribution consistent are almost always the same duration which seems to be a pretty small duration as opposed to the next guy, which is a second action I trigger. For second action I trigger, I say, oh, I'm not that consistent. Most of the times, oh, it's okay, it's not, it's not that bad. But sometimes it's taking way, really, really too long. I need to do something about it. And this is where you could start drilling down and figure out, so for this guy that's taking long, you know, what was happening in my system? What was happening at the Ruby interpreter level? Or what was happening in my OS? I will answer this kind of question. And so it's instrumentation of the requests, but you have the same stuff for, uh, oop, maybe I didn't enable it. Here we go now, for the database uh, request too. So you could analyze how long you're spending in your database query uh, using Gateways too. So if we go back to the presentation, uh, the great stuff about Gateways is you can drill down to your system. You can start at a very high level saying, oh, this request is slow, or this collection of requests are slow. And from this analysis, try to figure out why, going down and out, refining your understanding little bit by little bit. You can start saying, you know, oh, which method, which Ruby method is taking a long time within this request, so going from application level to interpreter level and say, oh, is this method? And within this method, you're going to say, so what's taking long at a system level within this method? And you figure, oh, it's just TCP access. Only when I'm talking to this IP. Oh, so this subnet is actually going slow right now. So that's a kind of investigation. You can go from very you know, broad top level to very you know, um, sharp low level. Or it could be the opposite. It could be like, I have this system problem that's happening, like the lock we have on the file. You know? Why is this happening? What was, what was going on upper level in the stack? And you could say, oh, when this is happening, before that, record which request and record which method, and I'm going to be able to go up the stack again. So this is where D-Trace shines. Um, I think, considering time, I'm probably going to skip this demo. Uh, I did all my demos come online. Uh, but the cool thing about Leopard is it comes out of the box with something called Instrument, which is a kind of visualization tool built on DTrace, which is pretty awesome. 
and come with stuff that are useful out of the box. Something that is worth investigating is you can build your own custom instruments. So for example, if you use X-ray for DB request or your own custom probes, you can define new instruments uh, in this application, recording only this and give you a visualization of it and auto-completing what you can do, this arc zero stuff. Uh, so I encourage you to, I think it's a new instrument, build new instrument, and you're gonna see exactly the same stuff, prop description, predicate, action, the same thing, just nice and graphic, uh, and you can auto-complete the probes you're interested in. So what should you remember about this uh, presentation? I hope you're gonna remember at least one thing. And the one thing is, don't wait for your tough production problem to show up, you know. Don't get caught unprepared for the first time your deployment is gonna go so, you know. More importantly, do not wait. Do not wait for the emperor to take over your Mongol cluster, you know. <laughs> so, start training today. And how can you train today well, there's a lot of system tools you can get familiar with and on your day job, and that are gonna provide useful value. And like LSOF, you know, uh, like IOSTAP, like um, DTrace, you could use it for developer stuff. And if you get used with these tools, then you won't have to learn the tool and the problem at the same time when you know, time matters. You're gonna be in a, in a good, uh, in good track. So, I, there's a lot of documentation uh, on system tools on the internet. Uh, what I would recommend you to do, especially if you have a Leopard machine, is to install the Expert Jam. Uh, this way you got all this uh, you know, simple and uh, useful uh, Rails implementation. And you won't have to figure out uh, for a couple of days why Tracer is not uh, in the Leopard VM. Uh, I'm obviously not objective here, uh, but I would still recommend uh, reading my, my shortcut. Uh, for example, there's a great chapter uh, on LSOF, which is a well underused tool uh, in our community, uh, and I didn't have time to cover it tonight. Uh, you could look around on the internet if you don't know where to get started with. On my website, I posted a couple of pointers, especially for DTrace. You're welcome to check it out and um, to have fun with it. So that's it for the presentation. Thank you very much. Hope you liked it. Now, if you have any questions, we're a good time to ask them. Go for it. I was actually just trying to do some of the things you were showing there. And, um, I ran the uh, dtrace um, Ruby target function into the command. And I get failed to grab a PID 75804. That doesn't have PID. Yeah. Uh, so the OS current failure. Any idea what that might be? How did you use this PID? Uh, with the dash P parameter. Yeah, do you have a double target such as you would be? Uh, well, I found the PID with uh, PS, PS manager. Let's do it up right. Basically, this Ruby probes are targeted to a specific PID. So you don't say just Ruby. You say Ruby equal to 34 if you created it like 34. Uh, and you keep going. I want you to do your demo, but you don't have the PID. So instead of putting Ruby equal to 34, you can Ruby double target, and then you dash P, what you did before. And even if you do this, you can make sure it's not interpreted as a shell variable, so it's getting the single post of the post. Oh, okay. Yeah, I did double post. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah, that's Any other questions? But for some reason, which slightly escapes me, is hardly, it's a mixture of, oh, I think we don't really agree with your design, we think it can be better than you trace. Uh, and it's also a mixture of uh, kind of different feelings of how to, to go for it. 
So Linux doesn't want to port Dtrace, which is strange because you know even BSD, which is pretty picky about what it picks, you know, uh, did port Dtrace uh, to the platform. So they read that and a couple of the companies are supporting uh, system tap as an alternative, which is fine. Uh, but the thing is, it's way behind. You know, system tap is still stuck in a kernel level, basically. It doesn't give you anything user level. And it's going very slow. I mean, unless somebody does a miracle uh, quickly, like, it's not going to happen uh, very quickly. So actually, like, if somebody is feeling pretty hardcore about, uh, you know, D-trace, kind of some tunnels and stuff like this, and want to give a hand on system tap, that would be great, because a lot of uh, our projects are deployed on Linux. And on Linux, we don't have a lightsaber. You know, we're stuck with a pistol at this point. Does that answer your question? <coughs> on my, so like on my website, I included some links to, for D-trace. It does include some link to system tap, the official website, and also some uh, opinions on system tap, but one of the D-trace guy. module that's calling the C extension. So you still have the, the cost of going from the module to the C extension. Uh, but reasonably for Ruby applications, this is, we don't care about it. This is really really small. small. Like, if, you, if you're writing a Ruby on Rails application, uh, you're probably not concerned about the cost of one single method call uh, within your system. You know? uh, so I would encourage you trying it. So that's a very, very, that's a very question. So one also one of the aspect of this space is like let's face it, like Ruby was lagging a little bit in terms of tooling, especially for performance and what's going on in your system. And they were like we're kind of lazy waiting for a good solution, I think. A little like, you know, we say like we're stuck with NVN until people embrace Git. Uh, like, we don't have a sort of common platform. We're not going to build some kind of instrumentation stuff for Linux, for blah, blah, blah. With Dtrace, we start to have a pretty compelling standard platform, standard APIs people can use to build whatever creative tools they can think of. So like, a Dtrace instrument in RRB would be awesome, you know? Like, uh, also, some some kind of demonstrations, not for Ruby, but for uh, more like um, an array disk uh, stuff. When your visual interface, when you would see what's going, I was telling you about drilling down. You would see on the top, you know what's going on for one uh, system. Then you could refine graphically what you wanted to see and see another line and see what's going on, and keep going this way. So I think as and you see what Apple did with Instrument. That's pretty also awesome. Uh, even if you could argue that some aspect of D-Trace could be leveraged even better by an instrument. But in any case, I think there's a huge potential uh, for writing amazing tools based on D-Trace. Because you know, it's still like, how many people are going to come online it and uh, write the script and stuff like that? Uh, I think especially like for startups you know, and people like with creative minds, uh, there's tremendous uh, possibilities for providing visualization tools the community needs based on D-Trace with standard API. Is that it? Looks like it. So thank you very much.